Today, I want to tell you about a problem that I'm sure many of you have experienced. You're trying to watch your favorite show, and it says, oh, region restricted, or accessing a website. You're like, I want to read something, and it's like, it's not available. Oh, often it comes up, it's not available in the EU. I'm like, why not? <laughs> what did I do? But good news, there is a solution to that, and that would be today's fantastic sponsor, Surfshark. With Surfshark, you can protect all of your internet activity and stay private, and that's kind of, you know, the normal thing about a VPN. But also, you can access new content. I've got a story. A few years ago, I was in America, and so I go on to Netflix, and I'm like, oh, brilliant, they have the whole of Mad Men on Netflix America. What's that? I download it all, you know, thinking, big brain, I'm going to download it all and then watch it when I'm back home. And uh, now I get home and it's like region restricted and this is just taking up a lot of space on your phone. But tell you what, fire up that Surfshark VPN and you'll be fine. With Surfshark, you can virtually travel the world in just one click. Just connect to a server in the country you want to visit and voila! You can access all the content you want. Plus, if you're traveling, you can easily access and unblock streaming platforms and even change your virtual location to get access to content back home. When I'm traveling, I often just have the VPN set back home anyway, so I get my nice familiar ads and it makes me feel comfortable. Plus, the Surfshark alerts so you can monitor your personal data, check for potential breaches, and get real-time alerts to protect your family. Plus, Surfshark antivirus keeps your device virus-free, and Surfshark search lets you browse without a trace. So if you want to protect yourself online and get access to content from anywhere in the world, go to surfshark.deals forward slash ITS and use the promo code ITS to get 83% off and three extra months for free. And don't forget, there's a 30 day money back guarantee so you can try it risk free in now today's video. It is unequivocally the worst place in all of Syria. And we would hazard a guess that it may well be the worst place on the planet. Located 30 kilometers north of Damascus, Said Naya Prison represents a level of cruel imagination that few could possibly conceive, and even fewer could endure. Said Naya Prison has been continuously open for decades, but at the outset of the Syrian revolution in 2011, the prison evolved from an already appalling detention center to a death camp. Moreover, it is a death camp that is designed specifically with the intent to punish its prisoners, not for information, not for reconditioning, but for the sake of punishment itself. Travel to Saidnaya prison is the absolute worst outcome for a detainee in Syria, a condemnation to a slow, excruciating demise, and one that seems to serve no purpose except for cruelty itself. Well, we've covered a lot of truly horrible places on this channel, and many of the methods of torture and interrogation that people have been subjected to across the centuries. But even in comparison, to our standard topics of conversation, Satnaya prison is just profoundly worse. Of course, we're going to cover it at our best level of ability and do all that we can to give voice to the prison survivors. Out of respect for their experiences and for the many tens of thousands of deceased whose stories will probably never be told, we're not going to withhold what information we know. But please understand, as we go forward, that this one will be difficult. The Assad family regime has held Syria in an iron grip for over five decades now, after Hafez al-Assad, father of the current dictator Bashar al-Assad, took power in 1971. Uh, once he assumed the office of the presidency, Hafez al-Assad relied on a network of detention centers to keep political opponents, dissidents, and other ideological adversaries out of sight, a network that swelled following the failed uprisings and social movements that took place during his years in power. Syria's prison infrastructure had been designed insidiously even then, with input from fugitive Nazi advisors and clear inspiration from a long list of other dictators. And during the years of Hafez's rule, torture and interrogation were absolutely widespread. Sanaya Prison was constructed during Hafez's years in power, first accepting detainees in 1987. Located near the site of the Christian monastery of Sidnaya, which held historical significance as a place of intersectional worship between Christians and Muslims, the prison is located just on the outskirts of Damascus, the city where the Assad regime maintains its seat of power. Ostensibly a military prison, Saidnaya has held thousands of soldiers and officers who have violated military orders, specifically directions to kill protesters or those who have tried to defect. 
but it also held political prisoners for most of its history, not just Syrian citizens, but the citizens of other Arab nations as well. It's far from the only Syrian prison of its kind. Tadmur prison, also in Syria, has its own decades-long history of sadism and brutality, but it was destroyed by Islamic State militants in 2015. But though Saidnaya prison evolved into its own specific version of hell after Tadmur prison did, it did evolve nonetheless. Saidnaya prison is a fortress, with an architecture designed to make large-scale revolt nearly impossible. The building is made up of three outward-facing spokes, each several stories high, which can join at a central, heavily fortified command hub. The three spokes hold hundreds of cells in total, and although it's impossible to know quite how many people are in the prison at any given time, even the lowest estimates suggest that well over a thousand people are in prison there. The higher, more realistic estimates put the number closer to five or six thousand. The spokes also house solitary confinement cells, which we're going to speak about a little bit later in all of their horrific details, so stay tuned. At the central hub, guards watch over the prison, while an attached building annex handles prisoner arrivals. When Hafez died in 2000, his son Bashar assumed control of the levers of power in Syria, despite frustration from much of the Syrian elite who disdained his lack of political experience and the obvious nepotism of his father. Part of old Nepo baby Bashar's great inheritance from his father, though, was the existing network of prisons and detention camps. The younger Assad put them to even greater use than the elder, and even before the outbreak of the Syrian revolution in 2011, the number of political detainees skyrocketed. During these years, Sadnaya prison grew increasingly shrouded in secrecy, becoming the legal and human rights black hole that it is today. These conditions led to the first known major atrocity within the prison, a riot in 2008 that led to the deaths of dozens of detainees. We should note here that there may well have been other incidents, even other massacres, before and after this one, but due to the Syrian regime's seal of information around the prison, it is impossible to know for sure. What we do know, according to the Syrian Human Rights Committee, is that on the night of the 4th of July 2008, the guards at Saidnaya prison changed the locks of all the prison cells, and the next morning, a force of additional military police arrived there. Once present, these new MPs joined the guards in a search of the dormitories, and during the searches, Islamist prisoners had their copies of the Quran trampled underfoot. The prisoners attempted to resist, and some 25 were shot. Verifiable information on the circumstances behind the incident is limited, and the Syrian government dispatched tanks and armored vehicles to prevent any concerned parties from coming onto the premises. However, many more prisoners are thought to have been killed after the incident, with estimates of over 100 executed by the end of 2008. This, though, it was all just a taste for what was to come. The revolution in Syria broke out in 2011 after the regime imprisoned several teenagers who had used graffiti to criticize al-Assad. It was the torture of these boys at other prisons within Syria that set off a cascade of political violence and revolt across the nation. But with that rebellion came a far heavier influx of political prisoners, revolutionaries, and ordinary citizens that had been arrested while demonstrating in the streets. Many of the detainees were sent to Saidnaya, from a far wider range of backgrounds and social classes than the prison had held previously. And as the protests turned into an open rebellion, and then a full-blown war, the already miserable conditions at Saidnaya prison grew far worse. Riyad Avlar, a Turkish citizen who spent 20 years in Syrian custody, testified that guards began to sexually assault the new prisoners, beat them on their genitals, and force prisoners to beat and kill each other. This is around the same time when Saidnaya prison goes dark, even darker than it had been before the war, and our ability to reconstruct any specific timeline of events just becomes totally non-existent. We can discuss numbers in aggregate, though, with estimates by Amnesty International claiming that up to 13,000 people may have been killed at the prison from the start of the revolution through the end of 2015. There's no telling precisely how many prisoners have been held there at any given time, but the number seems to be somewhere between 10 and 20,000. As for who those prisoners are, it's a wide range of people, some of whom are Islamic State and others Salafi jihadist fighters or even their leaders. Others are members of the Free Syrian Army, innumerable factions, while still others 
are just peaceful protesters, intellectuals, students, human rights advocates, journalists, and ordinary civilians swept up into Syria's often indiscriminate system. For the people sent there, Sidnaya is rarely the first prison that they've been held in, with prisoners often spending months or years in detention before their arrival there. It may, however, be their last, and very few people are able to survive detention long enough to secure their release. Most prisoners are assigned to Sidnaya after a brief, secret sham trial with individual accounts saying that the trials lasted mere seconds. Other prisoners have no idea where they are at all, what they're charged with, or how long they're going to be detained. To understand life at Sadnaya Prison, it's important to realize that this is a place that is fundamentally unlike even the worst prisons elsewhere in the world. At Supermax facilities, CIA black sites, and even places as bad as Bangkwan Prison in Thailand, which oh, we've actually recently covered in another video, prisoners are, at least ostensibly, there for a reason. Perhaps they are being tortured for information or held under such specific conditions due to the danger they pose to society. Perhaps they are sentenced for specific crimes with a level of extreme harshness that may dissuade others in a given country from making those same mistakes. At Sagnaya Prison, though, there are no interrogations. Torture is not to gain information, not to send a message to the outside world, not even to attempt to elicit compliance from other prisoners. The guards don't care about eliciting a confession. The prisoners are not told what they're supposed to even confess to. And if the Syrian government had their way, no stories, no bodies, and no evidence of torture would even be circulated to intimidate Syria's own population. The torture isn't for reconditioning or a reformation either. Nobody is at Sinai prison to earn their release. They're there to die. And before death comes, the people at Sadnaya prison are subjected to a degree of brutality that is truly unlike anything else on earth. Amar al shagra survived 10 months in Sadnaya prison at the age of 19 after his arrest for participation in peaceful protests. He spent two years in various prisons before traveling to Sadnaya, uh, which far surpassed anything he had been forced to live through previously. In his words, to quote, that prison called Branch 215 was a nightmare beyond anyone's imagination. There were worms eating human flesh. There were people eating each other in the prison. Diseases were unbelievable. People were thirsty and hungry at all times. But now, in retrospect, 215 owes heaven compared to Sidnaya. End quote. Ashogra describes a brutal system of social control within Sadnaya prison, one in which the threat of death by hanging, beating, or gunshot was always just an inch away. Prison wardens would demand that inmates kill each other, often arbitrarily. Even worse, the wardens would identify the family and friends of their prisoners and offer their prisoner a choice. Kill their loved ones, or kill themselves. If a prisoner chose to kill himself, he was choosing death not by his own hands, but by incomprehensible torture. Execution practices at Sadnaya did not stop there. In 2017, an Amnesty International report found that between 2011 and 2015, over 50 people a week would be executed by hanging en masse, with their killings carried out in secret in the middle of the night from inside the prison walls. At a minimum, that works out to well over 10,000 prisoners killed via mass hanging alone, and there is no indication that this practice would have stopped or even slowed down in the years since. When a prisoner was to be executed, their name would be called for transfer to a civilian prison, but instead they would be blindfolded, brought to a specialized cell, and horrifically beaten. Still blindfolded, they would be brought to the execution building, with the first indicator that they were to be killed being the placement of a noose around their neck. Prisoners who were too thin or too young to die quickly because of their weight would be left hanging for some 15 minutes and then killed by assistants who pulled them down sharply, breaking their necks. The prisoner who had been kept above the execution chamber described, If you put your ears on the floor, you could hear the sound of a kind of gurgling. This would last around 10 minutes. We were sleeping on top of the sound of people choking to death. This was normal for me then. The Amnesty report adds that those who were hanged were buried in mass graves by the truckload with their families. 
never told of what happened to them. The report describes systematic deprivation of food, water, and medicine from inmates in a process that is not only negligent, but deliberately sadistic in nature. Rape and sexual violence are common within the prison walls, perpetrated both by guards and by prisoners forced to rape each other. Beatings are arbitrary and completely unregulated, with many prisoners receiving lifelong disabilities from these assaults, while many others uh, were killed in the process. Individual survivors describe being stuffed into a tire in order to be beaten, and having guns forced into their mouths, and having fingernails and toenails ripped out. Other accounts tell of inmates being doused in fuel and set on fire, and then left to take weeks to die with no treatment. Prisoners with infections and diseases, even easily preventable ones, such as ingrown nails or small cuts are just left to fester with blood, pus, and excrement mixing into the dirt on the cell floors. When food does arrive, it is often scattered onto the ground intentionally, forcing prisoners to consume that same pus and excrement in order to just have a chance at surviving until the next day. The dead, they're still there on the ground too. The guards collect the bodies each morning for storage in rooms coated ankle deep in salt, where occasional living prisoners were sent to glimpse firsthand the fate that awaited them. It is in this environment the prisoners are forced to follow a series of rules meant to degrade, overwhelm, and deprive their senses. We luckily can't imagine and hope never to experience the smell of what we've already described or the taste of whatever rations these prisoners are forced to eat. But we do know that inmates are made to abide by a strict policy of silence. No speech, no protest, no whispers. This is accompanied by a uniquely horrid feature of the prison. It's acoustic design, which allows sounds to travel through pipes, vents, and hallways with particular ease. When a prisoner is beaten to death in one dormitory, the noise will echo into all of the ones that surround it in a brutal, constant assault. And prisoners' sight, too, is violated by the guards. Prisoners are often blindfolded or kept in the dark and are forced to cover their eyes whenever guards enter in order to prevent them from ever seeing or recognizing the faces of their captors. Prisoners are expected to assume stress positions while guards are present and are kept disoriented to their surroundings, their location within the prison and the structural design of the prison itself. Sleeping without permission may see a prisoner's clothes and blankets taken as they're forced to rest naked while in freezing weather. In this situation, the learning curve for a new prisoner is as steep as it is unyielding, with the price for any small misstep being as potentially high as instant death. New inmates are subject to beatings with metal bars and cables, sexual assault, and no explanation on why they are there, what the rules are, or how to prevent themselves getting hurt. Former detainees have identified screams as the mark of a new arrival. Prisoners who had been at Sat Naya long enough understood that they were to maintain complete silence, even as they were being beaten to within an inch of their lives. Any sound at all would ensure that the torture was extended. Now, this is all before... We discuss the hundred solitary confinement cells sitting beneath the prison's central command wing and the others throughout the facility. Two detainees described spending their first five months at Sidnaya Prison in one of those cells, measuring not even two and a half meters long by a meter and a half wide. That's roughly seven and a half by five and a half feet. In that cell, they were packed in among up to 15 people at once, kept in the freezing cold and forced to take turns to sit down. For five months, they endured as a water was shut off for up to days at a time, causing hallucinations and hysteria. When that ordeal ended, they were not released. They were simply brought into a standard dormitory, where their internment continued. Now, the reason that we share these gruesome details, and in fact the reason that we chose to speak about this prison in the first place, is because... As of now, there are untold tens of thousands who have died behind this prison's walls, unlikely ever to be named. In many cases, the stories told by survivors are the sole means of remembrance of those people. In a world where this prison is still open and running, those stories take on additional importance as they are the only means of recourse by which we might encourage the wider world to take notice. A common message between many survivors are the words passed along to them by those who remained. 
remember us. Among the many people working to bring voice to those imprisoned at Sidnaya Prison is Lawrence Abu Hamdan, a sound artist who was able to reconstruct much of the prison with the help of a forensic architecture team. No images of Sidnaya Prison's modern interior are currently known to exist, but across hundreds of hours of painstaking interviews with survivors, Hamdan and the Forensic Architecture Agency worked with Amnesty International to recreate the space. Deprived of light and forced to avoid looking at their surroundings, prisoners at Sidnaya often develop a highly attuned sense of hearing, acute enough that Lawrence could reconstruct not just the layout of cells, but the size of corridors, the placement of pipes and stairwells, and a map of where each survivor had been over the course of their detention. The forensic reconstruction process was a deeply difficult experience for many of the former detainees who worked on it, but the end result has been a powerful tool for advocacy as well as an aid for the treatment of other survivors who have emerged. Luckily, we are fortunate enough to have access to the testimony and the memories of many such survivors, and though we cannot share them all here, we can at least leave you with a few accounts of what those survivors experienced behind the walls. One man, known as Nader, described an incident in the prison as follows. Every day, there would be two or three dead people in our wing. I remember the guard would ask how many we had. He would say, Room number one, how many? Room number two, how many? And on and on. There was one time that the guards came to us room by room and beat us on the head, chest and neck. Thirteen people from our wing died that day. A survivor named Omar shared his own experience of having witnessed the acts that prisoners were forced to perpetrate toward one another. I don't even know what term to use to describe what I saw. The guard would ask everyone to take off all their clothes and go to the bathroom one by one. As we walked to the bathroom, they would select one of the boys, someone petite or young or fair. They would ask him to stand with his face to the door and close his eyes. They would then ask another, bigger prisoner, to rape him. No one will admit this happened to them, but it happened so often. Sometimes, psychological pain is worse than physical pain, and the people who were forced to do this were never the same again. A man known as Salam provided testimony on the welcome party that would greet new inmates on their first day at the prison. Quote, You're thrown to the ground, and they used different instruments for the beatings. Electric cables with exposed copper wire ends. They have little hooks so they can take a part of your skin. Normal electric cables, plastic water pipes of different sizes, and metal bars. Also, they have created what they call the tank belt, which is made out of a tire that has been cut into strips. They make a very specific sound. It sounds like a small explosion. I was blindfolded the whole time, but I would try to see somehow. All you see is blood. Your own blood. The blood of others. After one hit, you lose your sense of what is happening. You're in shock. But then the pain comes. And finally, a former detainee known as Hassan, who described having listened to prisoners be beaten immediately prior to their executions. Quote, We always wondered where they were taking people at this time of the day. We were very scared, because why else would they take them at 3 a.m.? They made me scared, and I always try to forget it. But we cannot forget it. It's in our bones. There are a long list of individual accounts from the prison, many of which can be found in Amnesty's report and all of which deserve to be heard. But the painful reality is that even these stories represent just the tiniest fraction of what has happened at the prison, much of which will just never be known. It's heartbreaking and it's infuriating all at once. But that appears to be exactly what the Assad regime wants. A legal and societal black hole from which no light can possibly escape. What Bashar al-Assad's regime has done at Sadnaya prison amounts to extermination. As defined by the International Criminal Court as an intentional massive homicide of an entire group of persons. Without compunction or remorse, the guards and administrators of Sidnaya have constructed one of the most ruthless and most terrifying death camps that the world has ever seen, and one that still carries out its inhuman task to this day. The prison itself, the torture, and the execution practices put to use there, and the scars it leaves on its survivors are a precise and utterly intentional construct of sadism. 
It could not possibly be an accident, and it could not possibly have happened if Bashar al-Assad and his highest officials were not directly complicit. Unsurprisingly, Syria's justice ministry rejects these reports out of hand and refuses to acknowledge any wrongdoing. With no clear means of recourse and no realistic path that would see Sadnaya prison shut down or the Assad regime deposed in the immediate future, there are few options for concerned onlookers around the world. But what we can do, as we've said several times over the course of today's video, is to speak about what has happened at the prison to amplify the stories of the survivors as best we can. Former inmate Diab Saria put it best in an interview for Amnesty's Forensic Reconstruction Project, to quote, I lost five years of my life there. I nearly died there. I just want it to remain so that other generations will see this horrible place where we were tortured. The world should know it's the worst place on earth. Mm -hmm.